Father, thank you for this night. Uh, Lord, I do pray, Father, that you'd speak to us. Lord, uh, we're here for a reason. It's, it's not just to sing worship and, and uh, praise you in that way, Father, but we also want to learn of you, Father, to draw closer to you through your word. And Father, the, this message uh, is for each one of us. And so, Lord, whatever it is that you'd have for us, Lord, help us to uh, be fertile ground, Lord, for your word to take root, Lord. So I pray, Father, that you'd set your heart, your, your word ablaze in our hearts, that you would just anoint it, Father, that you would speak to each one of us, Lord, and draw us closer to your heart, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you remember, last week, uh, Luke was up here, and he was finishing up his teaching uh, about the rebellion of Absalom. Um, Absalom had uh, came against David, and uh, then... He was defeated, and King David is returning back into the land. Uh, Absalom was David's son, and he figured he would try to kill his father in order to become the next king. Not only would this have caused a lot more trouble in uh, David's own family, but it causes a lot of trouble in the nation of Israel because this is the person that God has established to be the king. It wasn't Absalom. This wasn't God's doing. This was man's doing. Absalom trying to take the kingship for himself. So uh, some of these guys that we saw when David was returning were for David, and some of them were for Absalom. And so David now has the uh, task of trying to unite the nation back together. Um, one of the things that we saw him do was he made a guy named uh, Amasa his military commander. Um, and he was part of Judah. And uh, he was the military commander under um, Absalom. He was one of the guys that was uh, trying to kill David. But now David has him as his military commander. And everything was going good. Uh, people are helping the king come back. Uh, the ten tribes of Israel, the northern ten tribes, and Judah and Benjamin were there. And they're all celebrating, bringing back the king. And then uh, there was this argument. Uh, that sprung up, and uh, the tribes of Judah were pretty, pretty uh, aggressive in their argument. Uh, so apparently they won. Well, this guy named, um, I believe it's Sheba, he stood up, he blows a trumpet, and he says, what have we to do with the king? And so the ten tribes of Israel, they take off. They say, fine, we're out. And uh, what happens is David says, you know what, I got a job for you, Amasa, uh, your first job. You're going to go out and you're going to gather the troops. First job, not too difficult, right? Just go get the troops. You have three days to do it. Go gather the troops. But the guy doesn't return. Not in time anyways. And David's concerned about this man named Sheba, who's starting another rebellion. And uh, he says to Abishai that he wants to uh, get his personal bodyguard, those that are loyal to David, and send them out after this guy. And so he sends Abishai, Joab's brother, out with the, the guys, and they're to quickly go after him before he can find himself a, a fortified city. Well, if you know the story, he does find a fortified city. It's like in the northernmost part of Israel. It's up by the tribe of Dan. And he goes behind the wall, and he's in there, and Joab comes uh, and with the, the men and uh, starts attacking the city. But on the way, on the way, they see Amasa heading back. And Joab, uh, I don't know if it was an accident or if it was planned, but somehow his sword falls out. He picks up the sword, or maybe it just fell out of his robe. I don't know. Uh, but he walks up to Amasa as if to kiss him. He grabs him by the beard as if to give him a kiss. I, don't, I haven't kissed any man by grabbing him by the beard. That's kind of weird. But apparently that's how they did it. You grab his beard and you give him a kiss. I don't know if they grab each other's beards and just, you know, but whatever, they're, they're, he's going in for a kiss. At least that's what it says he was, uh, was doing. But in his hand, he had, a, he had his sword, and he kills the guy. And uh, Luke had pointed out, which was a great point, that because Amasa was from the tribe of Judah, this could have easily cost David another one of the people that were supporting him. 
But that doesn't happen. The rebellion of Sheba is defeated. Uh, the lady in the town has the people throw the head over the wall. He takes it back, and that's done. Now, it's a, it was kind of a crazy, crazy story. Uh, how you can go from supporting the king and everybody's behind him. Yeah, we know that God has established him as leader. The people have said so. They know that David's supposed to be the king. Nowhere does it say that they knew the Lord was establishing Absalom as the next king. So that's never happened, but they still don't get behind David, um, not fully, because it was so easy for one little argument to cause everybody to take off and go their own way. So uh, the second rebellion was done, and then we come to chapter 21. Now, uh, there are some people that believe that in 2 Samuel, this would be the, or chapter 20 was the last chapter, and chapter 21 is just kind of uh, information about the life of David. Um, we know that in the Hebrew Bible that it's all, it's just the book of, of Kings, I believe, um, where it's just all one big book. But here, some people believe this would be the end, and, and what we have in the rest of 2 Samuel is information, just some of the fill-in, some of the stuff that happened during David's life. I don't know exactly how all that works out. There are some events that the timeline gets messed up, so it is possible. But we come into 2 Samuel chapter 21, and we're going to be um, discussing something that happened before David became king. So let's get into 2 Samuel chapter 21. It says in verse 1, it says, Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king called the Gibeonites, and he spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn to protect, sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Therefore David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you, and with what shall I make atonement, that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? So we see uh, an account of a famine that was going on in the land. Um, while David was king. They had no food, and it is possible that it was because there was no rain. It says it's a famine, but it's highly likely there was also no rain, and that's what's causing the famine. But when you live off what you grow and the animals that you raise, if there is a famine, it's a big deal. If it goes on for a couple of years, then it could be a life or death situation. It's a full-time job just providing for yourself and your family, especially during a famine. You're doing everything to make things grow, and when they're not growing, uh, I, I, I imagine the stress that goes along with it. Um, but David sees a famine, and uh, there's not much food the first year, and could be the Lord, just could be a famine, just could be a dry year, could be you know a dry spell. The next year it goes on, well, the third year he starts praying uh, and asking the Lord, what's the deal here? You know, hard work is a good thing, but no matter how hard they were working, there was still not enough food, which is part of the reason why David's praying and asking God if there's a reason for this. God, are you behind this famine? Are you doing this? What's the reason here? The surprising answer is, yes. Yes, I am. See, God was allowing there to be a famine on the land because of the sin of Saul, and it says, and his bloodthirsty house. Now, that doesn't mean that every time there's a famine that God is bringing judgment on the people, but in this case, it was God's doing. Now, apparently, Saul and his family had killed the Gibeonites, uh, the first king of Israel thought he could do Israel a favor and remove this Gentile nation that was among them. And God hadn't directed him to kill these people, but Saul did it anyway. See, Saul's crime was not just that he killed the Gibeonites, but that he broke an oath between the Israelites and the Gibeonites. He broke a promise. He bo broke an agreement. He was the king, and he thought he could break this covenant if he wanted to. And you may be asking yourself, I don't remember these guys. What's so special about the Gibeonites? 
Who are these people? Well, Genesis 10, 15 tells us uh, before the Gibeonites came about the son of Noah, whose name was Ham. Remember, they got on the boat with Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Well, one of them named Ham had a son named Canaan. He was the father of the people who lived in the land that Israel now possesses. They were the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. They are very wicked, and God was giving their land to the children of Israel. They were to completely destroy these people. God had said in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 16 through 18, he said, But of the cities of these people, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive, but you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, just as the Lord your God has commanded you, lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations, which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. So you're supposed to wipe them out so you don't follow in their ways. They're wicked people, and we don't want you doing the same thing. We don't even want you knowing what they're doing. So these people are to be judged. God's already judged them. He says they're deserving of death. But something happens, and we find that in Joshua chapter 9, verse 3, it says, But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors. So what's happening is they're, the people of Israel now coming into the land, and they take out Jericho. Remember, they just marched around Jericho and the walls fall down, all except for one. And they take out Ai. And so these people of Gibeon are getting a little worried. And so they, they come up with a plan. It says they took old sacks of, uh, it says they took old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins torn and mended, old and patched sandals on their feet, and old garments on themselves, and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal and said to him and to the men of Israel, we have come from a far country. Now therefore, make a covenant with us. Then the men of Israel said to the Hivites, these are Hivites, which I thought was interesting, not Amorites. Uh, perhaps you dwell among us. So how can we make a covenant with you? But they said to Joshua, we are your servants. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? So they said to him, from a, a very far country, far, far away, really far. Your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who was at Ashtaroth. Therefore, our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say to them, We are your servants. Now, therefore, make a covenant with us. See this bread of ours? We took it hot for our provision from our houses on the day we departed to come to you. But now look, it is dry and moldy. And these wineskins which were filled were new, and see, they are torn. And these are garments, and our sandals have become old because of the very, very, very long journey. Then the men of Israel took some of their provisions, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. So Joshua made peace with them, and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the rulers of the congregation swore to them. So it wasn't just Joshua, but it was also the rulers. Now these guys, God said, were wicked. We see that they're liars. But they believed God was with Israel, and that they couldn't win a fight, so best to make peace. Yes, Joshua should have consulted the Lord and asked for wisdom, but he didn't. God had given Joshua permission to make peace with those nations that were very far away, but they couldn't live in the land that God was going to give to the Jews. This is what he said. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 10 says, When you go near a city to fight against it, then proclaim an offer of peace to it. And it shall be that if they accept your offer of peace and open to you, then all the people who are found in it shall be placed under tribute to you and serve you. And then verse 15 says, 
Thus you shall do to all the cities which are very far from you, which are not of the cities of these nations. So he had permission to do that, but they had to be very, very far away. And these guys said they were very, very far away. Well, I guess if you count three days' journey very far away, then that was it, but it's not. So now there is a covenant between Joshua and the Gibeonites, a promise not to destroy them. Now, when Joshua learned of their lies, he made them woodcutters and water carriers. They became servants to Israel, and they have lived among the Jews ever since. Now, Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin and from the area of Kibiah. What a coincidence. Which means he grew up in the area where the Gibeonites were from. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us when Saul attacked these people. We don't have an account of this where it tells how many people or whatever, only that he tried to kill them in his zeal for the people of Israel. Now, we normally think that uh, zeal is a good thing, right? But in your zeal, you can also be sinning. Paul was this way. In his zeal for God, he persecuted believers. He was trying to wipe them out, just like Saul was trying to wipe out these Gibeonites. This is what Saul did. But Saul's dead during this time. He's gone. It's perhaps years later that God brings judgment on the land. We don't know for sure. But God is punishing the people because of the sin. This verse leads us to assume that it wasn't just Saul who was guilty, but it was also his family because he had a bloodthirsty house that they were involved somehow. But it causes you to wonder, why does God care so much? They were wicked, right? They were wicked people. He already said they deserve death. Can't God say, I told you to destroy them, and it doesn't matter what Joshua promised the people? It doesn't matter what Joshua says? I said they needed to be destroyed. So you know what? My word goes, and Joshua doesn't. He, he has no right to speak for God. But that's not what happened. You know, God could have done that, but these are his people. And from then on out, anyone could say, you can't trust God or his people. They don't even keep their word. They don't keep their promises. But God keeps his promises. And he expects his people to keep theirs also. See, God may have intended for the Gibeonites to be wiped out because of their sin. But now that they have an agreement with the people of Israel, God is going to defend them, even against his own people. See, this wrong needs to be made right. This group of Gentiles has a place with the people of God. They are now under his protection. They are, uh, there are other accounts in the Bible where Gentiles have come under the protection of God and become a part of the children of Israel. There was a, a mixed multitude, if you remember, that left Egypt with God's people, and he protected and cared for them. And if you look at Rahab, the prostitute, she came under God's protection. She was from one of these cities that just got destroyed, right? Jericho. And if we look, we see a lot of parallels between the Gibeonites and Rahab, the hero of faith who is mentioned in Hebrews 11, verse 31. It says, like the Gibeonites, Rahab was a native of Canaan. Like the Gibeonites, she had confidence God was giving the land to Israel. Like the Gibeonites, she responded with fear before God's people, Israel. And like the Gibeonites, Rahab acted with cunning in order that she and her family might find refuge among the people of Israel. The parallels between the story of Rahab and the story of the Gibeonites seems more than just coincidental. The author of Joshua appears to be demonstrating on more than one occasion that God indeed intends to bless all the families of the earth through Israel. He promised that to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Even in the Old Testament, God was saving Gentiles. Now we know that God will always keep his word, and he wants us to do the same. Even if his people break their promise, God will not. Romans 11 verse 29 says, For the gift and the calling of God are irrevocable. He's not going to take them back. 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 56 says, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he has promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. 
And Titus chapter one, verse two says, the truth, this truth, gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. See, God is not going to change his mind. He's not going to offer you eternal life only later to say, you didn't make the cut. I changed my mind. God has promised those who believe in him many things, but our confidence isn't in the things that he's promised. It's in the one who's made those promises. He can't tell a lie. He's not going to change his mind. His promises are irrevocable. He's not going to take it back. He's planned for you to come into the kingdom since the beginning of the world. And he plans on spending an eternity with you. And I don't think you're going to miss that ticket. You're not going to miss that boat. It's not going to sail without you on it. See, David calls the Gibeonites and he says, What shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? It seems like Saul thought that he would bless the people of God by destroying the Gibeonites. And David is now saying, what can I do to make this right? How can I, how can I fix this? That way you will bless the inheritance of the Lord. I think they're part of that inheritance. Verse 4 says, And the Gibeonites said to him, We will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, Whatever you say, I will do for you. See, Saul as king sinned against the Lord, but David is going to the ones that Saul sinned against to make it right. They weren't looking for money or the death of the people. It wasn't an eye for an eye. You killed 500 Gibeonites. We're going to kill 500 of the Israelites. That's not what they're doing. It says in verse 5, Then they answered the king, As for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. David did this because he knew things needed to be made right. And in Numbers chapter 35, verse 33, it says, So you shall not pollute the land where you are, for blood defiles the land, and no atonement can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. You can't fix it unless it's by the blood of the one who did it. Now, we don't know when this happened or how many people Saul killed. The Gibeonites, they wanted revenge. They, they wanted it made right. They wanted the descendants of Saul to pay for his sins. So they asked for seven of his descendants to be given to them, and they will hang them before the Lord in Saul's hometown, Gibeah of Saul. According to the verse in Numbers, this is the way God gave to make this sin right. I don't know if this is coincidence what they asked for or if they had read this verse and they uh, uh, wanted it because of that. I don't know. Verse 7 says, But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. See, this Mephibosheth would, if he was in the line, most likely been the next one to become king. Uh, but that's not why David saved him. David had made some of his own promises to Saul and to Jonathan. See, to Saul, there was that time that he went into the cave to use the bathroom, right? And his men said, kill him, he's there. The Lord's delivered him into your hands. And instead, he cuts off a piece of his robe. And then Saul goes back out and David says, hey, my Lord, and shows him the piece that he had cut off of his robe. And when Saul saw that, he, he was surprised. The Lord had given him into David's hands. But then he turns to David and he says, Therefore, swear to me now, since I know you're going to be king, swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants after me and that you will not destroy my name from my father's house. So David made a covenant. David swore to Saul and Saul went home. But David and his men went up to the strongholds. So there's an agreement, right? There's a covenant. There was also a covenant that David made with Jonathan, which was very similar, that he wouldn't destroy him or his household, his family. We find that covenant in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 12 through 17. But David still has to make things right, but he's also not going to break his own promises. You can't make things right with God, 
because you broke a promise by breaking some other promises, right? They say two wrongs don't make a right. It says in verse 8, it says, So the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughters of Ea, whom she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she bore up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholathite. So David does find seven descendants. Two sons of Saul, whose mother was Rizpah, a concubine. One of them had the same name as Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth. Apparently that was a popular name. David also took five of Saul's grandsons. Now it says they were brought up by Michal, the daughter of Saul. She was David's first wife after her older sister, Merab, was given to someone else. And that's in 1 Samuel verse 18, chapter 18, verse 19. It said, but it happened at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David that she was given to Adriel, the Maholathite, as a wife. Same guy, same, same clan, uh, but different woman. Which is the same person uh, it says Michael was with. Now, that's a bit confusing. Um, there are two possible reasons for this. Number one, the translators got it wrong and should have put Merab down instead of McCall. And if you have a New Living Translation, an ESV or an NIV, and I'm sure there's some others out there, uh, in your book, in your Bible, it's going to have Merab there instead of McCall. So that's one, one reason they give why, why this doesn't match up. There's also another reason um, that uh, a couple of commentaries that I was reading through said, um, but that they were talking about uh, it's possible Merab died and her sister raised up the kids. And that's how Michael got her name in here, um, that she didn't have the kids. She just brought them up. Um, if you remember on Sunday, Paul talked about this a little bit. Uh, in 2 Samuel 6, verse 23, it says, Therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. So she didn't even have kids. So it's not possible that she has five sons. Um, but David, he takes these seven, these seven descendants to give to the Gibeonites. And in verse 9 it says, And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell, all seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest. So all seven were given, all seven of them were hung in Gibeah of Saul. And this was to pay for the sins of Saul and his household, to stop the famine. Now Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23 says, uh, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. Now, this doesn't happen, but I wanted to point it out. Um, the Gibeonites, we find out, do not intend to take them down that evening. So according to this verse, they would be, uh, they would be defiling the land. Uh, but they planned on leaving them up until the famine had stopped. Um, now, if you look up Israel and the barley harvest, that starts around March or, March or April. Uh, and this lady in verse 10 says, Now Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. And she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. Now, the late rains, they say, usually come in October. So this lady could have been out there for six months defending these bodies. She had sackcloth, which uh, she put on some rocks. She made a makeshift tent. She's out there caring for these bodies, uh, showing them honor. I have a picture. They, they snapped a picture back then. They had a black and white camera. And uh, this is the picture. It's a little grainy, but that's how technology was back then. And uh, there's Rizpa. She's got herself, a, I don't know what that is, a little bit of weed or something. And she's smacking the birds and kicking the dogs, uh, just protecting the bodies. She's uh, showing honor to these guys. She went above and beyond what most people would do, and her actions finally get back to David. It says, and David was told that Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, the concubine of Saul, had done this. Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh-Gilead, who had stolen them from the streets of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hung them up after the Philistines had struck down Saul and Gilboa. So he brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there. 
and they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. Now, apparently it's rained, which was a sign that God would no longer bring a famine on the land, or at least they took it as a sign. I believe David was moved by how Rizpah had honored the dead. He had no ill feelings towards Saul and his family. He wasn't trying to hurt them or, or eliminate them. He made a promise not to, right? Uh, and he wanted the people to know this, so he honored the dead also by going and collecting the bones of Saul and his son that had died by the hands of the Philistine and who were hung just like these seven, seven of his descendants. And he took their bones from Jabesh Gilead and brought them back and put them in their father's tomb, their father's sepulcher, wherever they had that. Um, Rizpah was standing guard over these guys, and when David goes and gets the bones, he makes a big deal about bringing them back. You know, finally laying to rest the, the bones of King Saul and his sons and these descendants of his. It says they buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin in Zilah. We don't know where that's at. In the tomb of Kish, his father. So they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. See, after all this was done, the sin was dealt with, and the bodies laid to rest, then God listened to the prayers of the people for the land. The famine was ended. And I was looking at this thinking, does that mean God wasn't listening to their prayers? Are there verses that talk about God doesn't listen to our prayers? Well, Micah 3 verse 4 says, Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time because they have been evil in their deeds. You know, our sin does something to God. It hurts the heart of our Father. And when things like that happen, if we don't want to deal with our sins, if we don't want to get right with the Lord, then that's going to be the main focus. That's what we have to deal with. It's not that God can't hear he, he counts the hairs on her head. I'm sure he hears our prayers. But he turns his face away. He chooses not to listen because we need to make the main thing getting right with the Lord, getting rid of this sin. Sin is a big deal. I think we look at sin and, and it's just, yeah, it's a mistake. It's something we did wrong. It's not that big of a deal. But if that was the case, then there would be no reason for him to send his son to die for you and me so that we could have eternal life. Sin is a very big deal. And it says that when we do that, it hurts the heart of God. And it, I found a few more, but I'm not going to list them, where God chooses not to listen until we get right with him. See, if you choose to sin and not repent, then yes, I believe God will also choose not to listen. But also know that if you do repent and ask for his forgiveness, God will hear you and he will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will restore you. He's looking forward to hearing all that you have to tell him. He wants to listen to your prayers. Tonight, the study has been a lot about a promise that Joshua and the people made with the Gibeonites. But God's made a lot of promises himself. And he doesn't want his people to misrepresent him. Right? When Moses misrepresented the Lord uh, by smacking the rock twice, you know, he didn't get to go into the promised land. God took it serious. And he's taken what Saul did by misrepresenting him and attacking the Gibeonites very seriously because he keeps his promises and he doesn't want no one to think that he doesn't or to look at his people, those who call, are called by his name and say they don't keep their word. The Bible says that you're supposed to let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus said that you're not even supposed to make promises. Just keep your word. Don't even make oaths. Just do what you say you're going to do. God does what he says he's going to do. And what kind of confidence would we have that what he's asked us to do, I mean, just believing in Jesus Christ and we'll be saved, maybe that's not enough. Maybe God didn't mean it. Maybe I don't understand it. This Bible is pretty thick. Maybe I missed something. But then God would be a liar. And he says that's all you have to do in order to be saved. He's going to keep his word. And we can take that to the bank. He holds his word more important than his own name. Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but his word would not. God loves us. He cares for us. He's made promises to us, and he's not going to break those. And it says that all we have to do 
in order to be lumped in with his people, in order to be covered over by his protective hand, in order to be mixed in with his chosen people, is to believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's no other name under heaven given by which you must be saved except for the name of Jesus Christ. He's paid it all. He's done it all. And all you have to do is ask him. And he'll forgive you. So if you think that your prayers aren't being heard, if you think there's a disconnect between you and God, then do like David did. Ask him. Ask him if there's something you've done wrong. Ask him to reveal to you what the sin is. If there's something you've done. And restore that relationship with him. And you can have that walk. And you won't have to worry about it again. Because he's faithful and he will keep his promises. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that you, you are a promise keeper, even if we are promise breakers. Lord, we pray, Father, as we desire to represent you, to live a life for you, to be that, that shining light on a hill, to be that example for you, Lord, that you would help us to keep our promises. Help us to be lights for you, Father. Uh, Lord, when people see us, we pray, Father, that we'd be able to provoke them to jealousy, that they'd want what we have, Lord. Help us not to defile ourselves with lies and, and not keeping our word, Father, like you'd have us to do. Lord, I pray, Father, that if there's someone out here, Lord, that has heard the word, that they would have confidence knowing that your word says all they have to do is believe. And you will keep your word. You will bring them into eternal life. Your son has paid the price for their sins and given them these robes of righteousness on which they're able to walk into heaven because of what he's done and not what they've done, Lord. So, Father, if there's people out there, Lord, I pray that they put their trust in you, that they choose to follow after you and have that confidence that they are yours and they are mixed in with your people and no one's gonna come against them without you coming to their aid. So, Father, we do pray for ourselves. We pray, Lord, that your word would continue to speak to us, that we'd meditate on it, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.